What's what's next? Dr. Wiley's here. Hello. Um, talking about the history of medical education, where we are today. Um, very I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna let her take over. Dr. Wiley, great to see you. Thank you for joining us Thank at Brain you. Turns. And um, uh, you could have given me a heads up that I was following an Olympic gold medalist. Excuse me, uh, but you know, come well, on. It's better guys. than following a Nobel Prize winner. So I think that's you're probably, true. That's at least she's true. not a you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay, take topics. care. Different topics. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Langer. Bye. <laughs> um, we're so excited to have you. Um, I So you are a professor as well and director of science education at Zucker School of Medicine um, at Hofstra Northwell. Um, so this seems like a good like format for you <laughs> to talk to all of these as kids, young adults, um, who are just like so excited about medicine, want to learn. Um, so yeah, feel free to take it away. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Yes. Um, here we go. So is that working? Does everybody see that? Yes, we can okay. see your screen. So um, I want to say I'm really pleased to be here, and um, I'm going to. There'll be some of my colleagues talking to you guys later this, um, during this, whoops, I'm sorry, during the summer. And I'm trying to make these, there we go. I'm trying to make this little, there we go. Um, so there'll be some of my colleagues talking to you later this summer. And I think I speak for all of them that we're really super happy to be invited back this year. We um, presented last year. Um, and um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the medical school curriculum, which uh, you know, okay, that's that's fine. But I wanted to sort of make it a little bit more interesting. So I decided to do uh, sort of a tripartite approach. And that is, I thought I would, um, whoops, I thought I would start out by talking a little bit about the history of medical education. Because first of all, I think it's really fascinating. It's a little bit weird. Um, and it, it really informs how we got to where we are today. Um, then I'm going to talk about medical education in the 21st century, because whether you know it or not, um, there was a really big kind of cultural and uh, uh, pedagogical shift in the early part of the 21st century in terms of training medical students. Um, then because COVID-19 was such a, a huge disruptive force, I thought I would talk a little bit about what we learned um, in our curriculum um, with COVID-19. And then I think this whole thing, I can wrap it up in half an hour because what I would really like to do is have a uh, discussion or questions um, with students. So you guys ready? I guess so, let's get going. So you can read what the title of this slide is, but I really would actually like to title it, but it might be a little bit too snarky to actually write it down, but I would like to actually call it why does Columbia call their medical school the College of Physicians and Surgeons? Did you ever wonder about that? If you knew that, did you ever wonder about that? Because aren't surgeons physicians? So it turns out that this is probably, I don't know, I haven't talked to the folks at Columbia, but I think it probably stems from the way medical education um, and the way medicine was viewed before the night, so from the Middle Ages up through the 19th century. And it, that very long time ago in Europe, um, there were two types of what we would now consider physicians. There were academic doctors, and that's these dudes um, with their, you know, frilly Renaissance collars. Um, and they belonged to a sort of class of learned gentlemen. And to become a physician, you did a lot of academic training, which means you went to lectures, you read a lot of books, you chit chatted probably over sherry. Um, with your fellow white man. And um, the only actual skills-based training you got was how to prepare drugs from various herbs and who knows what. There was no technical requirement for any kind of graduation or certification or licensure exam. You just sort of went to, you went to these lectures, you chit-chatted with your colleagues, you got to some level where you felt like you were proficient and then you hung up your shingle. Um, now, on the other hand, there were surgeons and surgeons were considered really like, a, it was really a skill-based 
uh, activity, much like you would consider now a car mechanic or a, an electrician. Um, and so surgeons were all practically trained and they didn't do any kind of book learning, no anatomy, um, which is shown here with our learned gentleman. Um, and they really, a surgeon was a barber, he was a, uh, a dentist, he could be a battlefield uh, guy who specialized in amputation. So it seems completely sort of odd to us that surgery was relegated to this sort of blue collar work. But if you think about what surgery was at that time, there was no anesthesia, there were no antibiotics. So surgery was a last resort sort of absolute, you have to do it because there was at least a 50% chance it was gonna be lethal. And it for sure was gonna be painful because there was no anesthesia. So being a surgeon was not at all glamorous. It was kind of an ugly, messy, bloody job. Whereas being a learned gentleman and you know, uh, holding a patient's hand while they fought off the pain of cancer, which you couldn't really do anything about anyway, uh, was a much more sort of a prestigious career. So things began to change. Um, in the 19th century and then early in the 20th century. So um, I'm a microbiologist by training. So the 19th century, the, the latter half of the 19th century is when germ theory of disease was ushered in um, spontaneous generation as a, as a legitimate scientific uh, theory was finally disproved by Pasteur. So um, there was a great firmament in science and the surgeons, uh, the surgeons guilds, so these groups of surgeons uh, were eliminated. And interestingly, the French Revolution actually had a lot to do with that. They got, got rid of guilds altogether. And uh, instead, uh, if you were a physician or a surgeon uh, or a physician and did surgery, you were an academic doctor. So in order to become a doctor now, you had to increase your amount, the amount of academic learning that you had um, because there was so much more scientifically going on. But what's uh, kind of uh, horrifying to me is that even though these, these guys here were doing surgery, they still had very minimal or no practical training whatsoever. Um, and again, graduation remained optional in the Netherlands. They sort of started some kind of testing program, but that kind of fizzled out. So graduation remained optional. Tests weren't really a thing. Um, again, if you think about being a patient in these you know, in these early times, um, you found your physician either because he was geographically close to you, remember that, you know, you can hop on the subway and go across town, um, or because this physician had a good reputation. And if he had a good reputation, it was probably because he was born into a higher class. So he spoke Greek and Latin and, um, you know, and how that was actually going to help you uh, be cured um, is not entirely evident. So moving to the US, of course, we were really the upstart colonies and we had to do things our own way. But I think to our credit, um, the early colonists or in the early in the 19th and 20th century, so they weren't colonists anymore, but they're early in, early in the US medical education um, development, they realized the importance of blending academic learning with practical training. And so although there were only a few programs that were affiliated with universities and most were for profit, um, there was a typically a two year program where you spend half the time learning by going to lectures. And this is actually a ticket for a lecture on surgery at University of Pennsylvania. Um, and what you did rather than having an exam or some kind of licensure was you, you saved all the tickets from all the lectures you went to. And this was sort of, uh, your evidence that you had been educated because you attended all these lectures. Um, and then also you did get some practical training as shown here um, with uh, this fellow with his saw ready to have at it. Because at this point, remember, you know, until um, ether was discovered in the late 19th century, very late 19th century, um, surgery was, a, was still a very crude and desperate act. Um, antibiotics really didn't uh, make their way on the scene until 19, the 1930s. We'll talk about that later if you want. So suffice it to say it was, it was better, but it was still not really very organized. And I think super variable is kind of the way you can think about it. 
So if you're sitting here thinking, yikes, this is kind of a mess, um, you're not the only one. Uh, the very fledgling Association of American Medical Colleges, which consisted of like Hopkins, Penn, uh, Harvard, a couple other East Coast schools, um, put this guy, uh, Abraham Flexner, on the road and asked him to take a tour of all the medical training programs. So the academic affiliated ones or the university affiliated ones and the for-profit colleges asked him to go out and see what it was about, see what kind of training was going on and to come back and develop a report that would provide some recommendations for standardizing medical training and, and sort of making it a, a more of a profession rather than um, what it was at that point. So he did that. It took him about a year to do his, his road trip and about another year to write up his report. And in 1910, the Flexner report was released. And this is still actually a very, very famous and influential report. Um, and so what he did was he recommended that all the for-profit schools be shut down and that all medical education be tied to universities. So what this meant practically was that all the, all the uh, for-profit colleges either have for-profit programs either had to find a college or university that would take them on or they uh, would never be accredited because the accreditation process began. And if they weren't accredited, obviously, then they wouldn't be producing physicians who could compete with accredited physicians. He also provided a roadmap for balancing theoretical and practical training. And that roadmap is still with us today. And before I talk about that sort of long, the, the long arm of the Flexner report that still is with us today, I wanna to point out one, which I hope is unintended consequence. I'm not entirely sure, but one of the outcomes of the Flexner report, as I mentioned, was to get rid of all these for-profit programs. The unfortunate outcome was that programs that were available to black men, women, um, and other minority groups um, were the for-profit programs. The academic institutions wouldn't admit women, they wouldn't admit black men, they wouldn't admit Jewish people. I mean, they were very, if you were a, a white male Christian, you were, um, you were in good shape, but otherwise, um, your chances of being a physician, unless you went to a for-profit program, were a pretty slim. So, um, so by shutting down all the for-profit programs, he, what happened was it sort of put a funnel on, or a, 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 um, on the number of women and minorities who were being trained. So for example, prior to the Flexner report, there were, uh, I think, 12 or 13 different programs. Uh, located largely in the Southeast that trained black men to be physicians. After the Flexner report that shrunk to three. So, and of course their capacity couldn't, you know, they could still only take the same number of students. So, um, so one of the sort of unfortunate consequences was that it enriched for white Christian men going into, into medicine and everybody else had to sit on the sidelines. So, Back to the long arm of the Flexner report, and that is the two plus two model. And this is really, this was more or less written in stone through the 90s, and it be, has begun to, well, in the early aughts, it began to sort of fray, and now it's um, still present in some schools. But if you're applying to medical school, um, you, you will see schools that still do this, I, I can almost guarantee you, and you have to ask, is this the right kind of program for me? So what Flexner did was he said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna double the amount of time from two to four years. And we're gonna spend two, the first two years doing only academic work. And the second two years will be only uh, practical work. And in those first two years, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have the first year sort of be an extension of undergraduate um, education where you take you know, four courses a semester and you're gonna do biochemistry and physiology, anatomy, microbiology. You're just gonna take these courses and you're not gonna learn anything about pathology or you know, abnormal health or, you know, or nutrition for that matter. The second year is where you're gonna learn all the abnormal. So you're gonna go back and revisit um, organ-based physiology, but now you're gonna look at all the different pathologies. Then in the third year is when you're gonna do your rounds in the hospital, your rotations in the various disciplines like medicine, surgery, 
psychiatry, which was fledgling again at that point, um, OBGYN, so on and so forth. And then the fourth year, the fourth year has always sort of been a stepchild of medical school in that different schools do different things with it. So some, and, and that was true then, it's true now. So some schools use it as a research year, some schools uh, so do a variety of different things. And some, some schools have actually even, a few schools have actually even gotten rid of the fourth year by, uh, these are schools that train physicians specifically to be primary care doctors. And in your fourth year, you enter their residency program. Okay, so that's the way things were. If we go back here, this is the, so yes, this it looks like a very old picture, but in fact, this is the way things were up through, I would say through 2005, 2010, really almost every medical school was still following this model. Uh, the addition of the USMLE step exams um, happened sometime, you know, in the, in the second half of the 20th century. And again, those have, how those are working has changed. And in fact, you're probably aware that step one has recently, this coming year will be the first year that step one is in fact pass fail. And I can answer questions about that if you want at the end as well. So in the early 2000s, there were a couple of things that happened. One of the major things that happened was there was a big report from the government that said, holy cow, our population is aging. The number of training of doctors we're training has not grown in 50 years. And we are gonna have a huge shortage of physicians by 2030. So this helped bring on this slew of new medical schools that have been have opened their doors in the 21st century. Many of the new medical schools, certainly Zucker School of Medicine, as well as some of the more forward thinking existing medical schools began to question what was once chiseled in stone in the Flexner report. So asking questions like, you know, is it does it really make sense not to have early first and second year medical students exposed to, to clinical medicine. You know, are lectures really the best way to learn? Um, should normal anatomy and physiology be taught um, together with abnormal or do you really need to have them separated? Should it be comparative or should it be separated? And then another thing is how do we develop students in their professional identities? So remember I sort of, um, you know, I. I sort of turn my nose up at the, the, the notion of learned gentlemen. Well, that was their professional identity back in the 19th century. Learned gentlemen were physicians. If you think about the ideal physician, the qualities of that ideal physician now being patient-centered, being, being um, altruistic, being available all the time, you know, um, those are the kinds of things that we want to develop now, being culturally aware. Um, so how do we help students develop those, prof those professional traits? Because we know that when you start medical school, you don't have them. Um, it's unrealistic and not fair to think that people start medical school already uh, having these kinds of traits. So it's something that people have to learn and how do we help students acquire that professional identity? So now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about the curriculum that I know, and that's the Zucker School of Medicine. This, this is our mission statement. So if you, I just want you to think about this compared to um, what you might have seen in the Netherlands or, or in England in the 19th or early 20th century, where, 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 where what we really uh, value is uh, community, scholarship, innovation, inno, innovation, excuse, excuse me, diversity, um, and really, trying to, to produce students who are gonna better humanity. So this is our, our mission statement. These are our, our values. You can see that they all revolve around patience. Um, so humanism, um, giving students time to reflect so that they can develop that professional identity, uh, scholarship, um, innovation, diversity, et cetera. So I'm gonna jump into some of the nitty gritty um, and walk you through what our curriculum looks like. So, in, so remember we had years one and two, according to the Flexor re report, well, we sort of um, tacitly rejected that whole idea that it's a year one and a year two, and rather because we teach abnormal and normal together, 
we have it on a continuum of the first 100 weeks. And students take one block course at a time. When they come in in August, they take a course called Challenges, Privileges, and Responsibilities, or CPR. This is a sort of general overview physiology course. And also our students uh, become certified New York State EMTs. And this is important because it gives them a baseline set of skills for which they are certified. Um, and I'll come back to why that's important in a minute. The remainder of the courses um, are, are a bit longer and they are not surface. This is a very sort of surface look at physiology. They take a deep dive and rather than being sort of organ based, what they are is we build a human being. So we start with cells and molecules, reproduction. Then we go on to uh, biochemistry and the GI system. Then the last course in the first in the first year before summer is um, uh, organ-based cardiac, pulmonary, and renal systems. Students then, if they stay in the, in the health system, uh, which is extraordinarily large, and do research, we have a stipend for them. So about 90% of our students stay and do research over the summer. And when they come back, they learn about immunology, microbiology, and infectious disease. And when they come back from winter break, they learn about really what makes us human. So the nervous system, the brain and behavior. So this is, um, psych, this is um, neurology, neur um, neurobiology and psych, uh, psychi psychiatry. Now you'll see at the bottom, it has this ICE thing and ICE stands for initial clinical experience. So our students are actually finished their um, face-to-face time in the medical school by 12, 12.30 every day. And one day a week, they go to an ambulatory clinic. So they go and to basically it's a doctor's office and they work one-on-one -on -one with a physician. It's not a shadowing experience. And that's why this EMT certification is so important because we make it clear to our preceptors that our students have skills and they're not there to be shadowing. We give them specific um, objectives to accomplish and they work with their preceptors to make sure that happens. So you can see they, they rotate through medicine, OBGYN, surgery, pediatrics, and uh, psych. So each course actually has three different components. So we have the basic science component. We have a component, we, as you'll notice, there's no anatomy course. So I'll talk a little bit more, a little more uh, length about what we call structure, which is a two year, it goes through the whole first 100 weeks, one day a week, um, where they um, explore issues of anatomy, histology, pathology, um, embryology and medical imaging, as well as physical diagnosis. And then patients, physician and society, you can think of as the doctoring course. So um, this is where they learn everything from um, ethics to clinical epidemiology, to interview skills, um, and clinical reasoning. So here's uh, um, one of our master educators. This is Dr. Alkowitz, um, and he's teaching in a large group, as you can see. Um, and I just want to emphasize that at our school, only about 20% of the student contact time is in large group. The rest is in small group sessions. And key among those small group sessions is our PEARLS curriculum. It, has, it stands for this big long thing, I'm not gonna say. Um, and essentially what this is, is a case-based learning environment where students are in groups of um, eight or nine, where they get two cases a week that they have to take apart and figure out what's the basic science that underpins this? What's the pharmacology that underpins this case? What's the pathology that underpins this case? And they come back and they discuss with each other. There are um, facilitator, a facilitator in the room. Um, the facilitator hardly says anything. And the facilitator is really there just to guide group uh, dynamics. The facilitator is not there to provide content. So it's really on the students to learn the material and teach it to each other. Um, here's our structure component. So the way structure works, so we have a very big structure team because again, it, what happens in a normal structure day, which would be one day a week, is the students come in and they rotate from uh, station to station 
where they will explore these different elements of structure. So they, there might be a, a cadaver at one station where they're doing surface anatomy. There might be um, uh, some uh, medical imaging at another station. So if, let's say if it's a, it's a cardiac uh, uh, week, they might have a surface anatomy where they are correlating part the locations on the heart with an EKG. They might have a, uh, um, an echocardiogram station. They might have a embryology station with the patent ductus from a baby, um, so on and so forth. So they rotate through four or five stations um, per session and each station is uh, has a facilitator. And in this case, the facilitator is there to provide, uh, to provide and guide content. Um, our other longitudinal components include clinical skills and, and uh, as I mentioned, PPS, patient, physician, and society. So um, you can see that we have, uh, we sometimes use each other, students use each other as patients, but we also have what are called standardized patients. These are actors who are trained uh, to portray specific uh, illness scripts. So they learn, okay, if I have lupus, this is how I should behave. Um, and so we use our, our uh, standardized patients as well. Um, ambulatory clerkships, that's our ICE component. So in the first 100 weeks, students go off and do um, an ICE experience, their ICE experience, or I know I just said experience twice, but um, their initial clinical experience. And we try to match students with specific preceptors. So for instance, if we have a student who's, who wants to work in, a, in a, uh, an office that has a lot of Spanish speaking patients because they're uh, bilingual, we'll try to do that. Um, we, tr we really try to match students with preceptors we think that, or offices we think that they'll thrive in. And then in the third year, um, even though the students are rotating through their inpatient um, uh, experiences, once every three weeks, uh, they come out and they do a, an outpatient with their outpatient preceptor. And what's interesting is many of the students elect to uh, do um, their continuity clinic with one of their ICE preceptors. So they have a relationship with this person, they get along, they like the office. So they, they get to go back and see those preceptors. And it's really, it's actually very nice. Um, oftentimes our preceptors, our ICE preceptors will come to graduation to see their student graduate. So that's, that's a nice bonding um, opportunity. So the second 100 weeks are years three and four. And this, so this second 100 weeks, this year three is pretty standard. So if you're applying to medical schools, this is what you should expect. You'll see that the class is broken up into a bunch of groups and each group will rotate through what are called core clerkships. And these include medicine and surgery, OBGYN and pediatrics, psych. Now we do neurology. Most schools don't do neurology. You would see family medicine here instead. Um, it's interesting that family medicine is not a big uh, entity in the Northeast, particularly in Long Island, uh, particularly um, in New York. So our students actually rotate through neurology and they do uh, neurosurgery as part of that clerkship. In between each uh, pair, students have two weeks. And this is a pretty unique to Zucker. You'll see it at a few schools, but not too many. They ha have two weeks where they can elect to go to whatever discipline they're interested in, because we really feel it's important for students to explore the different, because uh, the, the different um, opportunities, because they are trying to think about what kind of residency program to apply to, because they have to apply pretty early in their fourth year. So, um, you know, students might be going to an infectious disease rotation, an interventional radiology, uh, 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 cardiothoracic surgery, whatever that you know, the list is is enormous and they can pick wherever they wanna go. Then the fourth year, as I mentioned, when you're shopping for medical schools, look at what that fourth year looks like because it will tell you a little bit about what the school values. Um, some schools have a required research component somewhere between the third and fourth year. Um, as I said, 90% of our students do research voluntarily between the first and second year and by graduation. Um, I think our most recent number is 96% of our students do research. Um, we're not gonna drag that other 4% kicking and screaming into the research world. Um, 
Instead, what we do is we really want to get our students ready so that when they are interns, first year residents, they can hit the ground running. So our students actually have to do uh, three months of what's called an acting internship in three different disciplines. So acting internship means the student is functioning as an intern, but has a lower caseload. So they can select from either medicine or pediatrics. Um, everybody does um, emergency medicine. Again, they can do adult emergency medicine or pediatric emergency, emergency medicine. And then everybody does um, critical care. Um, you can see we have a lot of electives. I'm gonna talk about electives in a minute. And then career development is code for interviewing for residencies. Um, so then, so that's, you know, we had this beautiful program and everything was sort of running pretty well. And, you know, we're always improving and, you know, making nips and tucks here and there. And then, you know, this happened. So like everybody else, um, here we were in the, in, well, like everybody else in New York, here we were in the epicenter. Northwell Health uh, um, collectively handled more COVID patients during that initial surge than any other uh, health care group, you know, or, or organization in the in the United States. Um, so we were really swamped. So what did we, you know, how did we, how did we handle it? Um, well, we had to really think about what can we do in person, uh, what has to go online, and um, to take you back to March 2020, uh, it was right around, I always think of it as the Ides of March, it was right around March 15th. And what happened was our first year students had just finished this, their third course and they were getting ready to take their exam. And our second year students had just finished their last course and were getting ready to take the exam. We didn't wanna delay the exam, so we just had them take it online, signed a honesty pledge, completely unproctored, um, and uh, then the second year students were going into study period for step one. So that was more or less okay, although it was kind of a nightmare with the testing centers because they kept closing and jerking students around. We did have to deliver this course remotely. So this is the one and only course that we delivered remotely when our students started again in August of 2020. Uh, it was in, uh, for the first couple of weeks, um, was uh, remote, but once everybody was tested and we had a, you know, we had everything in place, we went to um, live in-person um, education. It was a bit controversial amongst some of our students because the other schools in the New York area remained remote. Um, our dean felt very strongly that learning uh, about how to be a doctor is not something you can do on a computer. That's pretty much a direct quote. So. We closed out those courses. We uh, delivered remote curriculum. Um, we did uh, a lot of sort of, we had a lot of meetings to sort of debrief, how did this go? How it was constant continuous quality improvement. Um, we really, everybody, students and faculty alike had to be flexible and adaptable. Um, you know, you went through it too. And we found that communication was super important. Um, one of the things we found we really had to do, we had to train, you know, we, nobody was doing Zoom. Nobody had any experience with any kind of video conferencing. Um, so we really had to do a lot of faculty. We had to get our faculty up to speed. Um, and we found that even giving large groups, it was better to break uh, the large groups into breakout rooms. You guys are all familiar with this now, but this was so new back then. Um, so we tried to do as much small group um, learning as possible. Uh, we decided that we had, well, obviously we had to do structure online, but we decided that it just is not optimal. But on the other hand, it gave us the opportunity to start a, a, um, a telehealth program, which was something we had talked about in the abstract and all of a sudden we were doing it. The second hundred weeks, what was interesting was we graduated all our fourth year. So remember this was March, they were due to graduate in May. We actually graduated our fourth years uh, in early April, and then they joined the Northwell, many of them, more than half of them joined the Northwell workforce um, in a special capacity so that they could help uh, ease the burden. So they actually worked for a couple months before going off to where they had matched for their residency. Um, 
what was really, really important to us was that students, the, the, the now, the second and third year students who were transitioning into third and fourth year students, that they didn't lose any time and they would be on track to graduate. So again, we had to be really super flexible in allowing people to, to take fourth year electives during that downtime. So we had, we had uh, students who were in the third year actually taking fourth year electives online um, so that they could make up the time, they would have the time to do the clerkships later. Um, so some of the things we did was we worked with our librarians and uh, really uh, we were aware of many of these online uh, resources, but we really reviewed them and started using them in great, in great detail. And this is something that is going to stay with us um, as we move forward. Um, we realized the students, <laughs> we never taught them about pandemics. Um, so we started a two, two week elective or, uh, slash selective. Uh, it was actually a required course for all the third year students on pandemics. So this was kind of interesting because this was the end of March, beginning of April through May, because we did it in small groups. Um, and there wasn't really much known about SARS-CoV-2 at the time. So we took more of a historical approach. We spent a lot of time talking about uh, testing and clinical trials. We talked a lot about the ethics. So you might remember this was when we were all worried um, that there was gonna be a, a, a shortage of ventilators. Um, and so this, this turned out to be, it was a two week course that all the third year students took. Um, and that turned out to be, a, I think a really successful um, orientation for the students before they went into third year and had to face COVID on the floors. The number of our fourth year electives actually exploded, um, almost increased by half. So we now have over a hundred um, third year, uh, fourth year electives, many of which are online and we continue to offer. Um, and uh, something that we initiated and has now been picked up by the residency program um, at Zucker Hill side, which is our, um, our psych department. And that is psychological first aid by telehealth. And I'm not going to go into it. I'm just going to say it was a really, it was a, it was a great success and, and has now become embedded in the residency program. Um, this is our very tired looking Dean of Student Affairs who spent hours communicating with students. Um, and we learned that there are some things you just can't teach virtually and that is structure and that is patient care. So when we re, when we, when the first year started in August of 2020, um, we initially started on a, on a schedule where they were only coming in for structure and clinical skills. Um, and then we opened it up for all the other um, learning activities. As I said, there's a few things that will remain virtual. Office hours is one of them. Um, uh, review sessions is another one because you get students are much more likely to show up if all they have to do is tune in. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, these all these um, online electives, um, they're so flexible. It's, it's, it's a really great thing. Um, and telehealth has now become an also embedded as part of our ICE and continuity clinic curriculum. So I'm just gonna wrap it up here. So uh, prior to the 20th century, just to summarize prior to the 20th century, you know, things were kind of a, a hodgepodge and patients were really at a disadvantage because you didn't know what you were getting. Um, I'm not entirely sure it mattered because remember this is the age of leeches and um, laudanum. So, so medicine wasn't that effective anyway. Um, and the, I would say the Flexner report was really a super disruptor um, and it really standardized medical education. Um, it really brought medical education to where it needed to be, but it had the unfortunate sort of uh, in it, uh, consequence of limiting the number of women and minorities um, uh, that was really uh, true up through until the, about the 70s. Um, and I, I will say that in terms of the number of particularly black men being educated, we have not made much progress since the 70s. Um, so our school, the Zucker School of Medicine is a 21st century medical school and we really try to be forward thinking. We try, this, the word status quo is only used in derogatory terms in our school. Um, we really learn from our students. We, our students get very tired of assessing 
learning activities, but that's how we improve. Um, and then the second huge disruptor was of course COVID-19. And I don't think I need to tell you that that, that was disruptive. Um, so in conclusion, I'm just gonna say that medical education will never stop innovating. And I wanna thank you for your attention. And I'm sorry, I'm not a gold medalist for uh, any kind of Olympic sport, but I'm here and I can answer your questions about medical school if you'd like. I will say that one of the other people who will be presenting, we have two other presentations from the Zucker School of Medicine. Our Dean for Admissions will be talking to you. So if you have really nitty gritty admissions questions, you should hold those until Dr. Woldenberg comes. And then we have um, a, a learning specialist, two learning specialists are gonna come and talk to you about how to study, how to time manage, how how to be a successful medical student from the point of view is of, of how do you handle that huge volume of information that just is kind of unrelenting, um, especially during the first two years. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna escape from this, I hope, and stop sharing and see if we have any questions. So. Hi, I can kind of filter questions for you. Yeah, that would be great. Cause it's, yeah. it's really yeah. hard to like read the questions, answer the questions. See, the, and with so many students, it's like this waterfall. Um, so something that was talked about a lot. Um, first of all, thank you for that talk. That was honestly really cool. A lot of stuff I didn't realize about like the history um, and stuff. Yeah, like well, that. so if you watch movies that take place like the, you know, in those times, you know, it gives you a new appreciation. Or if you read about the civil war, like, you know, more, obviously more people died in the civil war and in world war one of infectious disease than of, you know, anything else. But yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. And then seeing how far we've come to like in the operating room now, like all the like non-invasive techniques, it's crazy how like advanced surgery has become um, really, really cool. But a lot of people had talked about what are your thoughts on like medical school being free? Um, because yeah, so, so we would love to have, <laughs> We would, we, we think it's great. Are we in a position yet? No. Are we working um, in that position? Yes. In fact, if you look at the New York, the ranking of the New York schools, we're, if you take away all the free schools, <laughs> we're the top school. As, as the Dean says, it's really hard to compete with free. Um, I think it's really great. I think, however, it disadvantages certain students. So, uh, right now, there are only a few free schools. So unless you have above about a five, I would say 16 at the minimum, 515, 516, um, you're not going to get in. It doesn't matter. Like you could have, you could have like joined the Peace Corps, opened an, opened an orphanage and won the Nobel Peace Prize. If you don't have like a 515, you're not getting in. So I think it disadvantages a lot of students. Um, all of our um, scholarship money. We have an endowment that is only for um, scholarship money and all of our scholarship money is, is need-based. It's not merit-based. Um, so I, so while I think it's a great idea, I think until all medical schools are free, there's always going to be this, there's going to be a group of people, um, not unlike what happened with the Flexner report. There's going to be a group of people who have been disadvantaged maybe throughout their their educational journey, who um, would be amazing physicians, but because they're not good test takers or because they went to you know, a, a public university rather than a fancy Ivy League university, so on and so forth, um, they're gonna be disadvantaged and not be able to get in. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, another one here, someone asked if you could elaborate on the changes made to step one, like the new pass. -fit. Oh, so, 2022 will be the first year that step one is pass fail. So it used to be that the first two years, now why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but the major reason is that the first two years students were, what, what has happened is um, because the number of medical school graduates has increased, but the number of residency spots has not, mm -hmm. uh, it's become more competitive to get the residency of your choice. Um, so what has happened is the number of applicants that res residency programs are getting has ballooned. And so what they've started doing, what they started doing, and this was, you know, I think in the early 2000s, what they started doing was using the step one score as a, as a weeder outer. 
So if you applied to orthopedic surgery, if you didn't have a, above a certain score, it didn't matter what your grades were, they just threw you out because mm -hmm. they could do that with a computer essentially. And they didn't have to, you know, if you, if you have 650 applicants for five spaces, you're not gonna read all 650, you know. So, so what happened was that, you know, then the students realized that this is what's going on. So, um, what happened was during the first two years of school, students come in and start studying for step one on day one, some students. And it's this huge pressure cooker. The students are so worried about step one that they have blinders on. And literally, I mean, I've seen this in my own course where students will say, I don't wanna learn that because it's not on step one, you know? Which is like, yeah, but you know what? <laughs> You're gonna need this information when you take care of patients. So I don't care if it's on step one or not, you know, you need to know this. So, so there was this horrible tension between us professors and the students who were rightfully, I think, very concerned about their step one scores. So step one has become pass fail. Um, and hopefully that will take the pressure off of those first two years. But what has, what we're anticipating is that now step two, which is the one that students take typically took at the end of the third year, I think they'll start taking it earlier. Step two clinical knowledge is now the only standardized test with a three digit score. So we think we've, they've just sort of moved the problem <laughs> from the end of the second year into the third year. Yeah, but we'll wait to see how it goes. Yeah, I feel like it'll be one of those things you'll just have to see. Like Yeah, we have to see, yeah. But um, we are shortening the study period for step one and giving them more time to study for step two. That's good, yeah, that's smart. Um, this one, someone asked, uh, can you speak about how cultural humility is being implemented in medical school education? So more so, about yeah, I mean, I can talk about only our curriculum because I, I really haven't taught at any other medical schools. So, um, cause I was a full-time um, researcher before this. Um, so um, the, uh, our school has a very, very um, robust communications um, curriculum where students in the first year meet, well, in the first course, um, they meet once a week for two hours, and then they meet very regularly after that. And cultural humility is, is, is delivered in a very, I wanna say deliberate, but that kind of, kind of sounds clunky, but in a very thoughtful way. Um, we also celebrate diversity throughout the school. We have a diversity night where students of different cultures perform for each other and the food is like freaking amazing. Um, so, and we also, I mean, students have to learn cultural humility if they come to Zucker School of Medicine because they're gonna be working at, at LIG, LIJ in particular. LIJ, we have translation services for 155 different languages, just to give you some sense of, you know, Queens is really the most diverse place on earth. So, um, yeah. So we have a very sort of, you know, a very thoughtful and um, carefully delivered curriculum on cultural humility. Yeah, I hope uh, more medical schools continue to follow. Yeah. Lead. Um, all right. So I was seeing a lot of questions about, you know, does a B derail you? What if you did badly in one course? So, so these are questions you can ask Dr. Woldenberg, but I will say that, um, you know, if you, if you do poorly in one course, it is not the end of the world. It's probably not a bad idea to take it over and do really well. Um, and don't, uh, don't run away from it. Put it somewhere in, it's gonna be noticed uh, by someone. So somewhere on that application, either in the secondary app or in your personal statement somewhere, talk about what you learned from that experience. Don't whine and make a lot of excuses. Oh, I had mono and I was so sick and I couldn't study, but learn, if, if that was the case, talk about how mono made you more empathetic with people who are not well and cannot reach their potential. So look at that Look at that vulnerability, if you will, or whatever you want to call it, that ding, that blemish on your application. Don't try to hide it. It will be, it will be seen. But what you want to do is you want to think about what did I learn from this? What did I learn from it during? And what did I learn from it after? 
get that into your application, even if it's a short little one or two sentences, but then be ready during your interview to talk about it. That's great advice. I think it's, it's scary to have any kind of like vulnerability sure. applying, like you think it's going to hurt you, but talking about what you learned from it is, is probably. Okay. If you get a B, you should not retake. That is extreme. No. Yeah. And you just look neurotic. So. <laughs> Not yeah. a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is more like uh, specific to Zucker School of Medicine, but a lot of people were saying if they're already certified EMTs, do they have to? Yeah, you have to take the course over again. Yeah. Okay. So that's a, that's a quick answer. Um, typically, what we do is we uh, pair students so that the, the kids who are already EMTs are paired with other students who aren't. So mm -hmm. you are more in a coach is quasi coaching kind of um, relationship with your peer. Um, yes, we do accept international students. So the international questions, I'm gonna defer to Dr. Waldenberg. So wait till she comes. I think she's coming next week or the week thereafter. So so ask those. Yeah, that's kind of out of my wheelhouse. So we can talk a little bit too more about like the small group learning because um, that was something that like stuck out to me. Uh, do you find like, I feel like there can sometimes be in medical school, like everyone can be like competitive with each other. Do you So, so what you'll find is many medical schools, including ours have gone to pass fail for the first two years. So the students are not competing. Um, I used to teach at the undergraduate level and I know all about pre-meds, <laughs> um, I was also, you know, in a sea of pre-meds when I was an undergraduate, I know how that works and we want none of it. So it's all pass fail. We need our students to be teaching each other and to be studying together and to be working together. Um, so we've made it all pass fail. So it's a little bit of a bubble during those first two years because then what happens is they get into the third year where they are graded. Um, and it is super important because those grades are reported um, when they, um, yeah, pass fail is a beautiful thing. Yes, it is. Uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, uh, when they're, uh, so they get grades in their third year. So their clerkship grades are reported to the resident directors but when they're applying. So then what happens is, I've, so, so, so everybody who gets into medical school, at least to, into our medical school, was in the top, say, 5% of their college class, right? Well, now what happens is you take that top 5% and you smear them out over a normal distribution. Somebody's got to be at the bottom. You know, it just not everybody gets high honors. Somebody's going to be at the bottom. So it can be a little bit jarring or a lot jarring for some students when all of us, this is their first experience where they just get a pass rather than an honors or a high honors. So this is something that we work with our students and try to, um, you know, um, help them get get through it. So, um, so will medical schools start incorporating ways for students to learn about quackery, such as yes, we we actually talk about this sort of thing. So I teach infectious disease, and there, it's kind of shocking how much quackery there is. <laughs> there is. Uh, so we talk about the whole vaccine thing. We talk about for instance, uh, Lyme disease, uh, there's a lot of quackery around Lyme disease. So I think when it is relevant to what's being discussed, we don't have like a unit on quackery, but we, when, it, when there are conditions um, or therapeutics that compete with these kinds of uh, you know, um, ineffective um, but popular approaches, we do address it and help folks, under, help the students understand why we don't feel that they're effective and how to talk to patients about it. Most importantly, how to talk to patients about it because you know, patients who really believe that, really believe that. And if you just say, oh, come on, that's not true. You're not gonna get anywhere with that patient. So we talk to, to students about meeting their patients where they are and helping guide them um, to learn more so that they can make an informed decision. And you're not gonna win everybody, but yeah. I like that. Dr. Riley, I'd love to know if you could um, describe like the ideal kind of medical school student you'd want in your classroom, like what what would you what kind of student would you love to have? Like so, 
So most, I'll tell you that um, th about three quarters or between two thirds and three quarters of our students have taken at least one gap year. Um, so I think that this sort of ideal student is a student who's not gonna get, and hopefully this whole pass fail thing with step one is gonna help, but a student, one of the things about medical school is you take these students who are so eager to learn and so happy about being in medical school and especially with that two plus two model, you essentially beat that out of them. Mm -hmm. And so, so by the end of the first year, they're just like, oh, if it's not on step one, I don't care. I don't even want to know it exists. And that's tragic. I think, you know, because you've taken somebody who's really got great intellectual curiosity and just reduced them to this like machine where they just, this vessel where they just want to know what they need to know and nothing else. So, our program, especially with our Pearls program, we try to keep avenues for intellectual curiosity alive. So students who have that innate sense of curiosity, students who are readers, students who have interests outside of medicine, whether it's, um, you know, I was talking to a young woman in our BSMD program yesterday and she's, she's double majoring in, um, in biology and dance. Um, you know, students who have, you know, who are, who are sort of, you know, dedicated to something else, whether that's community service or a, a sport or, you know, so we really want students who are, are very, you know, I, I hate to use that term, but really well-rounded who have other interests in their life and are, and are capable of maintaining that intellectual curiosity, no matter how hard we try to beat it out of them, even though we aren't really trying to beat it out of them. Yeah. Uh that's cool. I think there is this like fear that all you do is study in medical school. Um, and while that's obviously going to be a huge part of it, it's like exciting to know that you can pursue other things too. Um, yeah. um, this is interesting. It's, I noticed med schools are classified as either research focused or like primary care, I guess, more mm -hmm. focused. They asked where is Dr. School of Medicine fall on this? Yeah, so we're a, a bit of an oddball where uh, uh, yes is the answer, yes. <laughs> so we have a very active, as I mentioned, research program. We don't, so some schools will require research. Other schools will require a community service or service, service learning. We don't require either, but we find is, as I said, 95 to 98% of our students graduate having done research, about 90% of our students publish during medical school. Um, likewise, a huge percentage, I'm not entirely sure what the actual number is, but I think it's above 80% are actively engaged in community service. So what we, we, you know, we're a 21st century medical school. So we wanna give our students space. We wanna give them space and opportunity to find out what, they're really, what they really love, what they're really good at. And then we wanna give them the support to go for it. So while you know, uh, I would say probably 40% of our students go into one of the primary care specialties, which is, would include internal medicine, OBGYN, or pediatrics. Um, surgery is also sometimes considered a primary care um, if, if you're going into general surgery. So, so while most of our students do go into that, those, um, those disciplines, very few go into family medicine, maybe one or two a year. Um, so I think it's, I think Zachary School of Medicine is really hard to pigeonhole. Yeah, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> um. <laughs> so I'm going to take the question, are medical inequalities talked about at Zucker? Yes, we have a whole, so what we call our curricular threads because we have these block courses. So a curricular thread is something that is touched upon in each block course in an organized, thoughtful way. So we have a curricular thread on health inequities. Um, and so, yes, we do. Um, and we have a lot of patients who come in and we really, our students really enjoy and we really find it very, very um, uh, worthwhile to have patients come in and talk to students about their experiences. So in my course, for instance, we have uh, three HIV positive patients who come 
And one in particular who's come year after year after year talks about the kinds of health inequities that she experienced when she was first diagnosed in the late 90s. Um, and it's, I think that as much as we push it out in an academic sense, hearing it um, from a patient is so much more impactful. So the acceptance rate, you'll have to ask Dr. Woldenberg. I mean, I think we had over 6,000 applications for 100 spots this year. Yeah, so, so that's kind of, that's kind of horrifying, yeah. Uh, I want to be conscious of your time. It is yeah. 12. Um, yeah, I do have another, I have a noon thing, but um, my favorite Grey's Anatomy character. I've only watched like the first season, so I'm not sure, sorry. I guess, I guess what's her face, the star, what's her name? Meredith. Meredith, <laughs> I guess, yeah. Yeah. Joanne, thanks so much for being here with us. And Oh, uh, sure. It's my pleasure. It was great. I've had the medical school's involvement. This is really critical to the success of the program because they're just it's such an important thing for these, for these folks to see. So thanks. It was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. I knew about the Flexner report. That was about it. Yeah. The early stuff is pretty, it's, yeah. it's interesting and horrifying all at once. Um, yeah. You know, it's one of those things, if somebody taped your face while you're reading it, it, it you know, it, it could be interesting. All right. Take care, everybody, and good luck. Thanks See for the invite. Tuesday. We're back on Tuesday, everybody. Have a good July 4th yeah, holiday. Yeah, have a great 4th. Yes. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Um, I, yeah, so we are back on Tuesday. We will not be doing um, a Monday lecture. And really quickly, um, everyone, again, please support Lenox Hill Neurosurgery buy this merch, it is really, really cool. You can go to each campaign separately. Um, the certain items can't be printed unless enough people get them. So, but we're good on the shirts and the sweatshirts. So buy water bottles and hats. Um, and again, thank you for giving us your time. Um, all right, cool. So we will see you on Tuesday. Yeah, have a happy fourth. Bye everybody.